Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming to uh, this annual lectureship uh, in honor of uh, Dr. Chandler, Lauren Roscoe Chandler, uh, as uh, he's better known to uh, people uh, during that time. Uh, is Yank, a, a nickname that he earned uh, playing uh, high school football. I think his high school football uh, gave him that nickname because he's a tall guy sit, uh, standing on the field uh, one day. He was born uh, in California, as you can see, and uh, he's uh, a Stanford through and through uh, uh, person. You can see that he went to undergrad as well as medical school here. and. Uh, uh, did his residency uh, at the Stanford Hospitals and became an instructor. And uh, in a very short amount of time, he became the dean for Stanford School of Medicine. Um, his uh, specialty is uh, taking care of children, uh, the surgical needs of children, and this predates uh, any fellowship uh, time. So he's a uh, um, giant among those days. Uh, um, and then uh, he served uh, 20 years as the dean uh, for the school. Uh, and uh, he's the president of several societies uh, listed there. And uh, he's uh, well loved. Um, I realized that I actually had a, a remote connection uh, with him uh, after um, uh, I visited uh, LA recently. As you know, I came from UCLA. Uh, over a year ago, and uh, one of my um, chief residents when I was an intern is a guy named Charlie Chandler. Never made the connection until I talked to him a few months ago, and then I realized that uh, uh, he's one of the descendants of uh, uh, Yank Chandler. You can see there may be a little resemblance uh, there. Uh, in his role as the dean, uh, uh, Dr. Chandler did many things, uh, but one of his uh, quotes uh, that really resonated with me uh, is uh, shown here. It says that I've always uh, believed that you should get the right man, and of course this is um, predating the politically correct uh, 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 phrasing those days. What we meant, of course, is to get the right person in the right place and then let him alone. Be sure that he's an expert in his field. Be sure that he knows how to teach and don't fence him in with too many rules and regulations made by people who are not experts. That is what the deans are for. So, uh, Here's a list of uh, the uh, previous uh, uh, channel lectures. You can see it's really the who's who in the pediatric surgery here. And uh, we're fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Rothenberg here and he'll be introduced by Dr. Wall. Thanks, James. So it really is a great honor to have uh, Steve Rothenberg here. Um, Steve is just sort of simply the minimally invasive pediatric surgeon. Um, he is a, uh, a mentor and, and frankly a hero for a lot of us who, um, who think about trying to push the boundaries of minimally invasive surgery in kids. Um, he's the one who, who started it. He um, went to medical school and, and did his training in uh, Colorado, but then went to England and did uh, uh, thoracic surgery for a year, brought back a lot of techniques and adapted really um, all the adult minimally invasive equipment and figured out how to use it in kids. Um, he did that along with a small group of people including Craig Albanese and some people from this institution um, who were the founding members of um, IPEG. So he's now the chief of pediatric surgery at the Rocky Mountain Children, uh, Rocky Mountain Hospital for Children uh, in Denver. Um, over 180 publications on minimally invasive surgery in children. He's gonna talk to us about that today. Um, and named the pioneer in surgical endoscopy um, from SAGES. So um, more than that, Steve's a, a wonderful um, colleague. He hosts a minimally invasive meeting every year that we really enjoy going to. We've gotten to know his wife, Susan. He's got three kids, of which at least one is more famous than he is at this point, and probably the rest of them will be soon, but you can ask him about that uh, at breakfast soon. Um, and finally, if if you know Steve, you know that the thing he's uh, most happy doing is being in the mountains of Colorado. So I don't think there's any chance we'll recruit him away from that, uh, that lifestyle, but it is really nice to have him here today. Thanks, Steve. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's a great honor to, to be here. Um, 
It, uh, and it's a great honor to be here for the Chandler Lecture. Um, I love that quote. And, and a lot of people would say, I'm not sure I was necessarily an expert in the field, but luckily I was involved with a group of people who let me alone and uh, didn't put too many rules and regulations on me. And it kind of allowed me to, to um, uh, do what, you got it? Uh, do what I accomplished. It's, and it's a great honor to be here at Stanford. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret that I'm here about 40 years late. This was actually where I uh, applied for, uh, to go to college and I got waitlisted and didn't get in. I was pretty devastated at the time. Um, so it's nice to, to finally get here, but uh, I guess it worked out okay. Um, anyway, um, these are my disclosures. Uh, I'm a, I'm a uh, the medical director and, and uh, have an ownership interest for Just Right, and I'm also a consultant for Storts Endoscopy. And this is really what I'm going to talk to you about today. And, and it, the thing that scares me most about this slide is that I've actually now been doing this for 25 years. I've been a pediatric surgeon for 25 years, and that just sounds like way old. I don't feel quite that old. But it really has been a progression over my career of trying to minimize um, the morbidity of a thoracotomy incision. And as James mentioned, I was very fortunate in that uh, partly, I think, as you, those of you who are in training, I would tell you that the best things that happen to you are pure dumb luck um, and often come out of some degree of adversity or not quite knowing what you're going to do. But I ended up having a gap year between general surgery and pediatric surgery. And because of that, I spent a year in England um, doing a thoracic, a general thoracic fellowship. And this happened by pure happenstance. I was uh, in my chief year of general surgery. I had applied to pediatric surgery. Was pretty sure I wouldn't get in because I hadn't spent three years in the lab or done all the other things that people needed to do it at that time, and I was uh, doing a, a young woman who had metastatic rhabdo at our county hospital, and the thoracic attending from the university came over to help me do it, and he said, this was you know my first month of my chief year, and he said, what are you doing next year? And I said, well, I'm applying to pediatric surgery, but I'm not very optimistic I'm gonna get in, um, and I really don't wanna go do an ECMO fellowship, or I'm not, I'm not a good lab person, and he said, uh, I said, what I'd, so I'd like to do something that if I get in will help me, um, and if I don't, um, that I could use in general surgery, because I'm probably not gonna spend a lot of time trying to do this. And I said, I'd, I'd love to get more thoracic training, and, and a, a number of years ago, the University of Colorado used to send their residents over to Edinburgh every year to do like three months on a general thoracic service. And yeah, I said, I wish you could do that now. Um, I really, and initially I thought I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon until I did my sub-internship in cardiac surgery and held the heart for, for six weeks, at which point I decided I really didn't want to do cardiac surgery anymore. And uh, he said, well, you know, it so happens I'm, I'm actually leaving tomorrow to go to, to London for a meeting. If you want, I'll ask around while I'm over there. And so he, he said, and last year I had one of their senior registrars in my lab. So he came back a week later and he said, okay, you have a job. You're gonna go be the senior registrar at the cardiothoracic center in Northern England, a hospital called Broad Green in Liverpool. And their senior registrar is gonna come over and work in my lab for a year. And it was like, suddenly I had something to do. I had something to talk about. Um, and I switched, we switched houses. Um, I had a, a two-year-old daughter at the time and we basically packed our suitcase, moved into his house, took his car. He moved into our house, took our car. Um, and it was an amazing year, and it really gave me a love and appreciation for thoracic surgery, which I think is very hard to get these days because they, we just don't have the volume of surgery anymore in, in the chest. Um, and I learned that there were a number of traditional standard approaches to access thoracic cavity, and I, I had the opportunity while I was over there, and I was doing adult thoracic surgery, so I was doing a lot of lung cancer, um, a lot of esophageal cancer, and I learned all of these approaches to enter the chest um, and learned that some of them are quite scary, like a Chamberlain procedure. I'll never forget the time I biopsied a mediastinal node and suddenly this big pool of blood came up through this tiny little incision and it's like, oh no, what do you do now? I can't really see anything, thinking there had to be some better way to approach these things than to do it or, or mediastinoscopy, which I think is a completely lost art, but again, putting a putting a, a rigid scope down in the pre-sternal, in the po, uh, pre-tracheal space to biopsy hyalur nodes. Um, and we got away with a lot, but it made me think about there's gotta be a better way to do this. 
And I also learned that a posterior lateral thoracotomy, which was the main thing we used, had a lot of morbidity with it. And my consultant had started um, look, working on a uh, sort of a muscle sparing technique. And, and so I developed that the year I was there. And I had a number of patients who needed bilateral thoracotomies, either because of metastatic disease or we were doing pleurectomies. And so some of them had a standard posterior lateral thoracotomy on one side and then a muscle sparing thoracotomy in the other. And they were able to tell me that the muscle sparing thoracotomy hurt much less. And so I got interested in trying to minimize the morbidity of what we were doing. But again, this was the primary mode that we used to enter the chest, and you know there were a lot of advantages. It gave you wide access. You could do most things you needed to do. Um, but again, we were dividing the major um, uh, chest and shoulder muscles. It was quite painful, and, and we were somewhat limited between the ribs. Um, but as a pediatric surgeon, it's a it's the approach that we use for most of our surgery. The other problem I found for a thoracotomy is, so this is a young woman, she, young girl, she actually came to me for a, a hernia. Um, I did not do this surgery, but she had a TEF as an infant, and you can see here that she has a, do you have a laser pointer? Sorry. Okay, in the drawer? No, that's a, no worries. So anyway, you can see she's got not a bad scar. I think most of us would say this is a really good result of having a, a thoracotomy incision. But if you look really closely, she's got a right wing scapula and she's got chest wall asymmetry. And I think this is, most of us would say this was a really good cosmetic result from our thoracotomy, um, but there's really significant morbidity there. And then you have things like this, which most of us say we never see anymore, but there still is a, a large portion of this. And as I reviewed the literature, I learned that really up to anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of children who undergo a thoracotomy as an infant or a small child end up with some degree of um, chest wall asymmetry, shoulder girdle weakness, and scoliosis. And so the incision itself really does have a lot of morbidity besides just the pain associated with it. Um, and some people say, well, maybe using an axillary thoracotomy avoids that, but you can see this is really not a very cosmetic scar. And for most of us, the exposure to get into the chest and do things through this incision is, is not great. And so I worked on this, in my fellowship, I worked on this muscle sparing approach, and that's where we didn't cut the large uh, muscles. We mobilized the, the latissimus dorsi and the serratus anterior muscles, retracted them posteriorly and anteriorly to give us access. Um, and it seemed to work uh, quite well, but you had to make bigger incisions because you need to mobilize large skin flaps in order to do this. In larger patients, you need to leave subcutaneous drains because you develop these large subcutaneous planes, and the access was somewhat limited because you could only mobilize the muscles somewhat, but I was convinced that this was hopefully causing less pain for the kids, and also maybe because we didn't cut the muscles, at least we would get rid of some of the issues like wing scapula and other issues. And, and we, I pursued this and we wrote it up actually during my, my fellowship. But I was looking for other answers that I thought would help. And, and when I was in England, I actually got to do the, my very first thoracoscopy. Now it was quite, it was basically a big round rigid trocar with, there was no CO2. Um, we used, uh, the anesthetists there were very good at double lumen endotracheal tubes, and this was primarily for cancer in adults. But we would put in this big round tube, and then we would use similar scope to a, a large biopsy um, forcep on a, on a rigid scope to go in and do pleural biopsies and things like that for asbestosis. And so I started thinking about that, and then when I got back, I, um, I found this. And, and for those of you who know Brad Rogers, um, I, didn't, I didn't know him very well when I, was a, when I was a trainee. I got to know him later, but he actually in the 70s did the very first pediatric thoracoscopy. And when people tell me that I'm crazy for some of the things I've done, talk about somebody who went against the rules. He, uh, he, so he adapted, um, this is cystoscopy equipment, and he would go in to do things like pleural biopsies, pleuridesis, I think even some small uh, punch lung biopsies using this equipment. He didn't have the fancy cameras that we have. He would look through the eyepiece. And even more amazingly, these patients were awake. They were just sedated. And he was doing this in kids. So um, I think that I actually are very low on the scale of 
normal to crazy when it comes to Brad, but he was a, a great pediatric surgeon and, and the, you know, he really is the father of thoracoscopy and I got a chance to talk to him and he gave me these slides and got some inspiration from it. And so when I got into practice, I started thinking, when I started my practice in Denver, I thought I, I want to do this and I had an adult, uh, there was an adult general surgeon in Denver who was, um, had been one of my ment trainees. Um, he was actually in private practice, but he was working with National Jewish Hospital, which is our big uh, pulmonary hospital in Denver, and he was doing biopsies for interstitial lung disease. And so I went and watched him, um, and then I became convinced I could do this in kids. And so I went and got, got the head of pediatric pulmonology, and I dragged him into an animal lab and made him watch me do a biopsy on a pig. Um, and he sent me my first patient, and uh, it was actually a 13-year-old uh, or 10-year-old boy who had a cavitary lung lesion that they couldn't figure out what it was. And he said, do you think you can biopsy it? And I said, absolutely. Had no idea if I could do it or not, but I was absolutely never in doubt. And I took him and it, we had the first large 12 millimeter endoscopic staples. And I went in and wedged out this cavitary lesion and ended up being Legionella disease, which they never would have diagnosed otherwise. And after that, we started do, getting very aggressive in doing lung biopsies in kids, especially with interstitial lung disease. And I think we showed that getting tissue really made a big difference. The video on the, on the lower end is how I do a, developed to do a biopsy in a small child because you can't put a stapler in a kid under 10 or 15 kilos and it was to use endo loops. And that technique ended up being airtight and watertight and we used it quite extensively until more recently when we've had a five millimeter stapler. So I think the advantages of doing things thoracoscopically were that we decrease the pain and morbidity, we decrease the surgical stress, um, hopefully we're decreasing the, the incidence of scoliosis and shoulder girdle problems. There was much shorter hospitalization. And one of the things I heard a lot as we developed these techniques is with one, well, I, I don't cause much pain because I make a tiny incision, and two, kids don't know go, go back to work. That was a big push when Lap Coley started is that you could get people back to work quicker. But we all know that a family is extremely dysfunctional when one of your kids is sick. And so by getting the kid back in the house and, and getting them back to a more normal routine, you actually do have the same economic benefits. And then I believe more than anything, it's improved visualization. I think we do these operations much better and I hope I can show you that. Um, and then obviously it's cosmetically superior. Um, the disadvantages was that it was a new mindset and, and pediatric surgeons I learned as I started to do this um, are a very conservative bunch uh, for, for a lot of reasons. I think, um, you know, they're all very meticulous and, and do well what we do, but it was hard to do it. The other thing is that we didn't have, we need special instrumentation and none of it really exists. And then you need to get, you know, most people's, I, I sort of think of pediatricians as parents and their main goal is to protect the child from the surgeon. Um, and so you have to convince them that this is beneficial and to let you do these things. And again, because I was starting a, a new children's hospital, I was surrounded by a group of people who um, were very supportive of seeing me being able to develop new techniques and, and exceed. So one of the things was initially all the instrumentation was five and 10 millimeters and it was quite long. Um, and so it was getting people to develop um, better instrumentation. And as those of you who rotated on pediatric surgery know, we use now we use shorter instruments, about 20 centimeters or three millimeters in diameter. We have, um, you know, smaller high definition scopes and cameras, um, but we needed new energy sources, new clips, new staples, a lot of things which weren't available. And then anesthesia was a huge deal. And it's how to, especially in the chest, how do we get single lung ventilation? I'd spent a year in England and every patient got a double lumen endotracheal tube. Well, you know, even in larger patients, we just don't use them that much. Our anesthetists weren't very good, but the smallest double lumen endotracheal tube is a 26 French. So you can't put it in babies and small children. And we had to figure out things. And initially we thought we needed to use bronchial blockers and things like that. But really what we found out is that the best thing to do is to do a main stem intubation on the contralateral side if you can. It works quite well. Almost all these kids tolerate single lung ventilation that way. And if not, we just use CO2 to collapse the lung. And then special equipment. And again, a lot of this stuff, as I showed you, I used endo loops to do lung biopsies. No one had ever really thought of that before, but that was available to me and would fit in the space. For doing more complex thoracic surgery, I came across this instrument. And this is 
um, was the, the first ligature. Um, it was called the LS1000, and this is a variation on bipolar technology, which seals the blood vessels. And one of the problems in working in these small spaces or doing complex operations like a lobectomy is that you have a lot of big blood vessels. And to be able to tie them off safely and divide them was very difficult. And so I adopted vessel sealing as a way to do this and developed techniques where um, we would um, dissect out branches of the vessels and make proximal and distal seals and then cut part way between them. And so it was like having two sutures separated and then making a cut between them to ensure that the, the sutures held. And so we would do that and we would, we would make a couple seals. As you can see here, we're sealing the segmental vessels. Um, and then I would cut part way. And once I saw the lumen and no bleeding, I knew it was safe. And that way, if the seals failed, um, I'd have an opportunity to recover before the vessel retracted and, and got, I lost control. And so that was a very important step for me. And it was part of what made me take a leap and um, in minimally invasive surgery, we really are dependent on the technology we have. But that instrument is quite large and I'll show you it's quite difficult. I also learned some hard lessons and it's always better to be lucky than good. So here's the same idea, I'm doing vessel sealing. This is the inferior pulmonary artery in a, one of the first lobectomies I was doing. And you can see here, I'm right on the pericardium and I'm making my two seals. I really haven't seen the vessel very well. I'm pretty sure I'm all the way around it and I made a couple seals. Um, and again, the technique of making two seals separated by hopefully four to five millimeters and then making a cut between them. Um, there is nothing about this video that I'm showing you that is the right thing to do. Uh, you should never do this. I have no proximal control. I have no length and safety. I'm way too close to the pericardium. And of course, it starts to bleed when I do it. The vessel was too large. Um, this is the part about being lucky. I was able to go back in, reseal it, and save it, and it actually held. Um, but this was a, a lesson in, in what not to do. And again, uh, luckily the ch child didn't suffer uh, because of what I did was uh, inappropriate. So were there exclusion criteria? Well, initially there was, you know, patients who were hemodynamically unstable, so requiring any presser support, patients who were on non-conventional ventilator support, and, and that's not the case anymore. We do it on all sorts of uh, ventilation. Um, patients who can't be transferred from the ICU, I have dragged a tower up into the NICU every once in a while. Um, initially the staff wasn't crazy about it, but they've kind of learned to like it. And then we don't do patients on ECMO and then um, giant tumors. And, because, and so over the last 25 years, basically every operation we do as pediatric surgeons, now we now and other places do do thoracoscopically. And there were some real lessons that we had to learn. For instance, positioning. When I was a general surgeon and when I spent my year in England, everybody was in a lateral decubitus position. Well, that doesn't really work in thoracoscopy. Um, in fact, so you want to change your positioning depending on what you're doing, and mostly you want to allow gravity to attract the lung for yourself. So set up it is extremely important, uh, and you learn that if you don't set an operation upright, that uh, it can be quite difficult. And so for things like lung biopsy, lobectomy, decortication, we use a lateral decubitus. Anterior mediastinal masses, we use sort of this modified supine. And for posterior mediastinal masses, TEF repairs, things like that, we use a posterior lateral. The other thing I had to learn was I, I had to totally change my approach. When I did a, a lung resection um, in an open fashion, still do, I stand at the patient's back. And I still, and do PDA ligations, I stand at the patient's back. What I learned thoracoscopically is that's actually the wrong approach. And in fact, I want to be at the front of the patient because the anterior chest wall is further away from the hilum, gives you more space to work in a direct view. And so we had to get away. The other thing was we always had the assistant on the other side of the table, and that's also a bad uh, approach because your cameraman is running the camera, and as all of you know, it's impossible to work in a paradox with the camera. It's very difficult. And so the surgeon and the assistant need to be on the same side of the patient. We learned that we needed to create a pneumothorax first, and so we always go in with a varies needle initially to help collapse the lung and give um, space. And in kids, we generally use a low flow, low pressure of about four millimeters and one liter per minute flow, but we can go up to get the lung increased. And we learned that when we do this, that kids tend to start having an increase in their end tidal CO2. Um, and some of that's okay. You can actually tolerate it 
uh, quite well, but if, um, but if your anesthetist started to overbag the patient because they were worried about it, the lung would come up and you couldn't see anything. And so we had to work very closely with the anesthetist. And so the first really more complicated procedure I did other than a lung biopsy was a PDA ligation. And I did the first one um, in 1993. And Laborde was actually, um, Francois Laborde in, in Paris was the first one to do this and describe it. He came out with his initial series in 95 and we followed shortly. I eventually had a chance to go watch him operate um, and even though I, he, was, he has a huge series, I disagree with everything he does. He stands at the back of the patient. He um, actually makes big, he uses open instruments, but he was, you know, a true pioneer in setting this up. Um, but this is kind of what it looks like. And so for those of you who do PDA ligations, you know we're always looking through a tiny hole with magnifying glasses trying to see it. Um, and here we're doing it, um, and it, we can see quite well, this is a little larger patient. This was a a couple month old. Um, the smallest child I've done this in is 900 grams, but this is really a difficult operation um, in a patient who's uh, under a kilo and probably under about 1,500, 1500 grams. So we tend to not do it in the micro preemies. We still do those open. But you can see the visualization is exceptional. Um, here you can see the, recur the vagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. We've never had a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury doing this because I think I can see it so much better. We dissect it out um, and then we'll just um, put a clip on it. Um, when I do these open, I tie them off mostly because I like the technical aspects of that. But for these kids, we pretty much just put a clip on um, and it's worked quite well. And we've done over a couple hundred of these now. Um, and we haven't had a conversion. I had one conversion in the first uh, two years I did this, but we haven't had one since. Um, this is an operation that we don't get to do very much anymore, but this was something else that, that taught me about thoracoscopy, and that was to do decortications for ampyemas. Um, and it, it was good because you could see everywhere. You could take down all the adhesions. I remember doing these open and trying to do a relatively small thoracotomy and, and really not being able to see, just breaking up the adhesions blindly. Um, and here you could see them all extremely well, although we don't do this operation very much anymore because now we just use TPA and a pigtail. Um, but we do have failures and we go in and do this. But it was another operation that really changed what we did. And then I started looking for other disease processes I thought I could, I could approach this way. Um, one of the early ones was foregut duplications because these are relatively avascular uh, structures, um, usually are, are shell out quite well. Um, and we would do that as well as some anterior mediastinal masses. And this is uh, a case we had a number of years ago that was a uh, parathyroid adenoma in a, in a uh, seven-year-old. And again, it was something you can see uh, how well the access is to the anterior mediastinum. And again, these were cases that often we were trying to do through a partial sternotomy, a Chamberlain procedure, or a biopsy through a mediastinoscopy. Um, but we proved that I think this was a much better way and, and much better um, visualization and access. And then even more complicated cases, this is a more recent case, but this is a giant bronchogenic cyst in a one-year-old that had become symptomatic. Again, you can see the setup in terms of where the surgeon and the, the assistant are. Um, and we approach these by shelling them out. The interesting thing about this case and again, the visualization, it's sitting right on the um, inferior pulmonary vein. Um, and so we'll have to dissect this off. This one was extremely inflamed and inherent. Um, but again, we're able to see so well. So here you see the inferior pulmonary vein right there. And you can see the view that you would have a very difficult time, I think, seeing through an open thoracotomy. Um, and this one actually came off right at the uh, right at the bifurcation of the trachea uh, and had an insertion site um, right at the carina. And then you can kind of see it right there. And when we got down to it, we simply just ligated it uh, and divided it. And this child did quite well and was able to go home the next day. So the exposure for the anterior and posterior mediastinum is exceptional. Um, and again, I think and benefited all these children that we were able to avoid, uh, avoid thoracotomies. So we started getting rid of some of our exclusion criteria, and the one big one was giant tumors. Well, you know, first and foremost, it's important that you um, 
you respect uh, cancer principles, but this was a, a little 12-year-old um, who uh, it was, had basically been asymptomatic and had this giant, almost volleyball-sized tumor in her chest. It had been biopsied percutaneously, um, and they thought it was a ganglioneuroma. Um, she was scheduled for an open thoracotomy, and then the, the parents came and found me, and they said, do you think that you can get it out? This was the largest tumor I'd ever taken out. Um, and the most difficult part was actually just getting around and working around the tumor. Um, but again, uh, you know, the visualization and the angled scopes really allowed us to do it. And it ended up the hardest part about this was getting it in a bag. And because we were suspicious, um, you know, we thought it was ganglion aroma, but you're never sure. We did put it in a bag and then we morselated it with inside the bag. Um, and here she is. And the most amazing thing about this is she's actually a child prodigy. You can say we had to make a little bit larger incision to get it out. Those are her scars one week after. Um, but this is her 10 days after surgery. And it, this was important because she had an audition uh, recital for Juilliard, um, which she did get into. And so um, I think you can see that the morbidity of the operation really is uh, significantly less. So after doing some of these procedures successfully, and, I'd been, and my true love was lung surgery and doing lung resections, and there aren't that many reasons to do them in kids. You can see them here. Um, I started thinking about ways to do it, and what we obviously see the most of are bronchopulmonary malformations. And there's a whole range of these. It's probably a broad spectrum as opposed to separate diseases. And we treat many of them. Um, the workup for these is um, now we're seeing most of these prenatally. Um, with, so we get a chance to talk to the parents and time the surgery. And most of these kids are asymptomatic when they're born, but um, as I'll show you, we've uh, gotten fairly aggressive about removing these lesions earlier on. So we started doing thoracoscopic lobectomies, and this was a technique I really had to start. And the first one I did was actually 1993, but it was really sort of a hybrid procedure, and that's when the term VATS was more popular. We made a mini muscle splitting thoracotomy, put in a couple ports, put in a camera, but mostly I spent my time trying to look through that tiny incision to operate um, with hybrid instruments. Um, but it was um, gradually evolved to being able to do these completely thoracoscopically. But the most important thing was really understanding the anatomic relationships. Um, and that's probably the hardest thing to do because we don't do these procedures very often. Um, and so it's hard to get comfortable with the anatomy. Um, and that's partly why, you know, subspecialization has occurred. But the lung anatomy is, is quite beautiful and, and tends to be quite constant. And so once you learn the segmental anatomy, you realize that you can use the, the relationships. For instance, you know, in the lower lobe, wherever there's a segmental artery, there's always a segmental bronchus right behind it. And you can use those things to help you. The other thing is in an open thoracic surgery, a lot of times we would flip the lung back and forth in order to access other areas, feel the bronchus, get an idea of what we're doing. And what I learned in thoracoscopic surgery is you can't do that because every time you flip the lung, you lose exposure and it becomes very difficult uh, in order to proceed. And so we really needed to learn to operate in the, on the lung layer by layer, going from sort of anterior to posterior and understanding those spatial relationships to make the surgery more effective. So some of the first things we did, this is a, an extra low bar sequestration. So again, this was um, you know, a simpler procedure. These, uh, as you know, have one systemic vessel that comes in. Um, and so these often, these lesions are usually separate from the rest of the lung. They have their own pleura and we simply dissect out uh, the, the uh, systemic artery coming off the aorta. It either comes off the thoracic aorta or comes up through the um, through the diaphragm, and then in this case, we're just clipping it. Um, I'm not wild about clips. They can come off, um, but we use them uh, for these larger vessels because they tend to be too, too large for the vessel sealer um, and too small for a, a large stapler. Um, but I think if you put a couple on proximally, you're safe. Uh, but obviously, the key here is to have proximal control. And then we get the specimens out. Um, but you always have to be real, ready for failure, and I guess that's uh, the other thing you need to do, so that should all scare you. I hope it did. Scared me. Um, I was helping a surgeon in New York do his first extra lobar sequestration, 
and we dissected out the artery and you saw that we had a large length of the artery. And as I was saying, you know, I think we can use the ligature on this. He just put the clip applier in and put it on. But what he didn't do is he didn't load the clip first. And when he closed it, he tore the vessel. Um, and so luckily, we had enough length of the vessel that we were able to get proximal control. And so that's sort of my fallback is because we're using devices that can fail, and I assume everything can fail, it's not a big deal if you have a short gastric vessel in it and you divide it however you do it and it fails, you have room, you have time. But in thoracic surgery, it doesn't take much blood to put you underwater and you can't do it. So the key is having enough length so that you have proximal and distal control and set up for failure. So having developed these techniques, we went on to do lung resections and um, I reported on the first series um, in 2008, and one of the things I learned is when we had these large cystic CPAMs is we needed room to work. And so um, I realized that you could pop the cyst using the energy device uh, to compress the lung in order to give a space to work. In the abdomen, we create space by um, expanding the, the dome in the, in the chest. We have to compress the lung to get it due. So either collapsing it with CO2 or non-ventilation and then collapsing the cyst. And then we can go ahead, um, and again, you can see we're using that LS1000 combination of three and five millimeter instruments, but you can see how large that device is in the chest compared to the other instruments. And here's the pulmonary artery, and it's the same idea of dissecting out. So it, it looks, it's not very elegant, it looks pretty gross, and the instruments are way too big for the chest. Um, but we were able to work around that and, and do, start a uh, report on the first series of lung resections using these techniques. Um, one of the keys, again, was setup. And so initially, when I'd watched other people do some thoracic surgery, everybody always sort of triangulated their trocars so that you could have access all over the chest. And what I learned was, again, sort of this front to back approach and, and wanting to be able to look down on your hand. So you want your right and left hand as close to 45 degree, or 90 degrees as you can for the most meticulous work you're doing. And then you really want the scope um, looking down on your instrument. So you can see that this, this scope, most people put the scope at about the tip of the scapula behind, and that makes it quite difficult, because then when you're working in the anterior part of the fissure, um, you're really working in sort of a paradox. And so I actually put the scope in the mid-axillary line below the tip of the scapula, so it's right over the fissure, and my working ports are more in the, um, closer to the anterior axillary line, and that was a big change. And, and probably one of the things I see people struggle with the most when they do these procedures is not that they don't have the technical ability to do it, but they just haven't set it up right. And that's uh, something that's hard to learn if you're not doing these procedures all the time. The other thing is that the instrumentation um, that was necessary to operate in small kids was not available. And I've been fortunate, and then I've been able to work with some very clever people to develop that instrumentation. And so uh, the, the little video on the right, you can see we're doing the pulmonary artery, the, the superior pulmonary artery to the upper lobe uh, in a three and a half kilo baby with an instrument that actually fits in that space and works. And that's revolutionized, I think, some of this more complex surgery. Um, and it's been, but the problem is getting industry to develop that kind of stuff is very difficult because we're a small market. Although all the general surgeons I show these uh, videos to say they want the equipment, but we've been able to develop a three millimeter sealer and a five millimeter stapler, which I think really is enabling other people to do it. And so now we go back to something like a lung biopsy, and here you can see um, the endoloop technique that I developed almost 25 years ago, and here's the technique in a, in a similar size baby who's got some sort, had some sort of intrauterine ischemic event in his lungs and doing a biopsy with a five millimeter stapler. Um, and so it becomes much easier and for surgeons who perhaps aren't doing a lot or is confident to do these procedures because it's much more familiar and, and it's a, a better, safer technique for them. And we talked about creating space. So here was a, a, a baby who was not prenatally diagnosed, came into the ER and respiratory distress at about a month of age. And again, you see these giant cysts um, and we can go in and, and pop them and compress the lungs so that we have space to work. Even though this child's only about four kilos, um, it becomes quite, it becomes much easier to manipulate and manage. And so this is kind of what um, 
a lobectomy looks like today with the, the newer techniques. Um, so here you can see the upper and lower lobe. So this is a baby with a lower lobe CPAM. Uh, as I always tell when I'm working with the residents, my, uh, my grandmother could do this one. Uh, it's quite a complete fissure uh, and that makes life a whole lot easier. Um, this baby's only three and a half kilos, um, but you can see that the instruments fit in the space. We have a right main stem intubation, so the lung is completely collapsed. Child's tolerating it quite well. Uh, we're dissecting out the, we're completing the fissure anteriorly and, and vessel sealing actually works quite well um, to complete the fissure. And we have the main pulmonary artery to the lower lobe, dissecting it out. Um, and now in cases where it sets up right, we can actually take that with a stapler. So this is a five millimeter stapler. And again, I told you I suspect everything can fail. And so you can see here, my, even though the stapler lays staples and divides the tissue, I always have proximal control. So if I'm taking a large sequestration vessel, I have an instrument proximal to the stapler. If I'm taking pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein, I have a stapler proximal on the proximal side. So I may get back bleeding, but at least I'll have control so that I can get in there safely and not have the child suffer. Um, because of the consequence of a failure. Completing the fissure, here's the bronchus to the lower lobe again. And, the, and now in lower lobectomies, I, when I used to do these open, I used to take the artery, then I would take the vein, and then I'd take the bronchus. But again, in that concept of just kind of like reading a book, going page by page, layer by layer, I now realize it's, it's better to take the artery take the bronchus, I can do that safely because I know the inferior pulmonary vein is laying right behind it. Uh, so dissect, carefully dissect on the back of it. Um, and then we can just, uh, in this case, just put a, um, a stapler on it. And again, this, this really makes the procedure much, much easier as opposed to previously what, what I would have done, which is dissect out uh, the segmental vessels, seal them proximally and distally and divide it. And I still do that in cases where there's a widespread of how the vessels come off. Um, but again, a single application of the stapler and we can divide the bronchus. Um, and one of the issues about the, the smaller stapler and the smaller sealer, sealers is just understanding the tolerance of the instruments. Um, you can, you can overcome them if you take too thick a tissue, uh, you can overcome the stapler for sure. And so there is definitely a learning curve with it. But again, um, you could never put a 12 millimeter stapler in this child, but it gets back to some of the principles that people are more comfortable with. And then finally, we'll just take the inferior pulmonary vein um, in a similar fashion. And again, the key here is having length. So here you can see the inferior pulmonary vein and being away from the pericardium here you see it on a stretch and we're able to put in the stapler and, and divide this. So as opposed to what we were doing before, which is individually isolating and ligating the vessels or individually getting segmental vessels and, and um, taking them at a segmental level, uh, we can now uh, do this more efficiently. Um, we certainly use the other techniques depending on the case, um, certainly in upper lobes, but in particular, it's just to show that it can be relatively straightforward and this lobectomy actually took 25 minutes. So they can be done quickly, better than I think we can um, open and divide it. So getting the right equipment really has revolutionized um, surgery. And I should say that part of my faith in staplers um, came from my time in England because the, the consultant I worked with stapled everything. I had always learned to tie off everything. In, in open surgery, he was stapling the pulmonary artery vein uh, and, and focus and using it extensively. So this is the last time I put the results together. It was up through April. So now it's well over 500 thoracotomies or th uh, lobectomies. Um, the operative time you can see is, is fairly variable, but most of these cases are done in under 90 minutes now. And actually the time for a trainee is, is um, just over two hours. So I think again, with the approaches and the techniques, they're quite comfortable with it as well. Complication rate is low and the average hospitalization is about two days. 
Um, we've looked at our kids under five kilos and under three months, which is when I prefer to do this when it, they're prenatally diagnosed. I think the surgery is so much easier. Um, and you can see here that the average operative time is less and the length of stay is actually less as well. Most of these kids go home the next day. And then the question is, can you do more limited resections? And this is a, an area I'm interested in. We're still sort of figuring it out, but this is the first time I did a segmental resection and it was a child I thought I was gonna do a lower lobectomy in and I got in and there was no major fissure. There were just these congenital um, sort of clefts and I could see cystic disease in what I assumed to be the superior segment of the lower lobe and then the posterior segment of the upper lobe and so we did segmental resections and then followed the child. Um, and there are certain cases where I think a segmental resection may be appropriate. It's if you can really tell on CT scan and what you see anatomically that the disease is just limited to one segment but I think it's important to do an anatomic segmentectomy. Um, and we've done a number of these now about 25 um, and we're following these kids closely. Um, I'm still not sure if it's the right thing to do or not, but we're keeping a close eye on it and we'll continue to follow these kids. I do think as our imaging gets better, and these are images from ERCAT, um, for most of you know the, the main MIS training facility um, in Europe and is run by Jacques Marisco, who's who's brilliant, but these are imaging techniques which may help us really define which portion of the lungs are affected, and we may eventually be able to do overlays on what we're seeing surgically so that we can do lower limited resections. And then, as I mentioned, it's always better to be lucky than good, um, and in 1999, um, IPEG met in Berlin, and about two months before the meeting, I got a call from Professor Waldschmidt, who was running the meeting, and he said, you know, I have a baby with um, pure esophageal atresia. What would you think about fixing it um, in live surgery during the meeting? Um, so at that point, IPEG, we usually had about 80, 90 surgeons. And, and uh, of course, I hadn't done a lot of operating in foreign cities at that point, but I had done some. And I'd never done an esophageal atresia before, but I'd been thinking about it. Um, and Tom Loeb, who's pictured up in the, uh, along with Keith Jorgensen, um, so he called Tom and I and said, what do you think? And of course, being the kind of people we were, we said, well, sure, we can do that, uh, having never done it before. And we spent a lot of time thinking about it, getting there. And here you can see, you know, we did the, so we did the first esophageal agesia repair. They had taken the kid to the OR um, like every few days and put in metal bougie stretching it out. I don't really think that made any difference, but it made us feel better that we knew they would come together. Um, but we were able to do it. We spent about two hours trying to figure out how to get single lung anesthesia. Finally got a, a Fogarty catheter down the right main stem. Um, and then we had not great instrumentation. You can see it's quite long, it's not ergonomic, but we got it done and the kid actually did okay. And then I thought, okay, I've done this, I can do a TEF repair and I waited for the right child and this was the right child. Almost a year to the day of when we'd done the case in Berlin, it was a big healthy baby about 3.2 kilos, didn't have any other problems. The parents were from Wyoming. They were good folk. I explained to them I thought I could do this and save their child a thoracotomy incision. Um, I told them I hadn't ever done it before, but I thought I had the skills and they allowed to let me do it. And this is Connor. He was the first baby in the world to have a thoracoscopic TF. And mom sends me a picture every year on his birthday thanking me again. He's a big strapping uh, ranch hand now um, and has done quite well. We had to learn about how to do this. Initially, as I said, I put these babies in a lateral decubitus position and I learned that was wrong, that really I wanted them almost prone so the lung fell away. Um, and then, you know, the steps of the operation were really pr pretty much the same. Um, and what I did learn over time is sometimes he needed to change trocar position. So I put the scope more posterior behind the tip of the scapula because I was looking in the posterior mediastinum. And I put my left hand most posterior because again, I wanted my right and left hand at, at right angles for doing the sewing. And this is kind of what it looks like. This is a little bit older video, but it's a quick two minute video. We divide the azygous. But one thing you can see here is the visualization is exceptional. And when you, I was trained to do this, the first time I did a TEF, I was actually a junior resident and I didn't do it. I was helping the attending, I actually saw nothing because only one of our heads could be in there. So. People say, well, don't we need to teach people to do open TEFs first? And my answer is no. I think I can teach them much better to do it thoracoscopically. 
if I need to teach you how to do an open thoracotomy, I can do that and then at least you'll know the steps and I can show you. So this is mobilizing the upper pouch, dividing it, and then we're just gonna do um, uh, dividing the lower pouch just as the clip. I take the fistula with the clip usually. Some people like to tie it off. Um, I think you do whatever you're comfortable with and then suturing it together. This is a 5 uh, PDS suture. In this case, it was quite easy. It came together quite well. Um, and then uh, just completing the anastomosis. Um, in general, most of these children get a contrast study on day four and are started on feeds. And this was the first uh, 10 years. These were the patients I personally did. Um, but you can see that the, we, you know, we got rid of our leak rate. We had no conversions. And uh, over time, we greatly diminished the, um, the stricture rate. And I think that was primarily technical. But it's worked quite well. And now mo uh, many, many centers around the world are using this as a primary repair. And obviously, cosmetically, it's significantly better. We're also doing long gaps this way, and, and I don't have time, but there's a lot of discussion. We could talk about that, but I actually think it's easier to do long gaps um, thoracoscopically because I think you can see better. You certainly can see well up into the thoracic inlet. Um, this is one of the longest gaps we've done. This patient was seven vertebral bodies in length and also had an upper pouch fistula. Um, and here you can see we're dissecting out the upper pouch. But you, the, the beauty of this is, you know, I can dissect well up into the thoracic inlet and that's where I get the extra length on the upper pouch. You can't really do this open because you can't see it there. And this kid had an upper pouch fistula, which is a fairly rare time of TEF. And in this case, um, and again, this child was two months old when he was referred. They didn't know about the fistula when they referred him, but we were able to divide it with a stapler and further mobilize it. And then even things like H-type fistulas. This has routinely been done through a neck incision. It was how I was trained to do it. But they're always right at thoracic inlet. They're very difficult to see whether you're doing them through the neck. They're very difficult to do through the chest. It, it, it almost can't be done. But because of the visualization that we're afforded doing these thoracoscopically, um, we're able to do it. And again, in this case, uh, I used to divide these and either clip them or suture them. And now that we have a stapler, we can just divide it with a stapler. Uh, and it becomes a very simple and straightforward operation. The other beauty of this is you can, I think, better avoid the recurrent laryngeal nerves. And if you look at some of the data, there's actually quite high rate of injury of recurrent laryngeal nerves, up to 30 or 40 percent in some series when done through a neck incision. And then vascular rings are another area where we approach these now. Um, this is a patient with a double aortic arch with the left atretic arch, um, and the visualization is exceptional. This is just a patient with a ligamentum arteriosum and a right arch um, that we can uh, just divide and release both the esophagus and the trachea, and it works quite well. Um, part of the issue with this is, again, people just don't have a lot of experience, and so we're trying to do more telementoring. So this is uh, me at five o'clock in the morning in my office, telementoring a friend of mine, uh, Todd Ponsky in Akron, Ohio, and really helping him. He certainly has the technical skills, but putting the ports, identifying structures, um, and approaching this the right way. So what have I learned? Um, probably not a lot, because I'm not very smart, but we tried. We use gravity. Um, we use insufflation. You have to have a good relationship with your anesthetist. That's key to thoracoscopy. There's uh, no way around it. So if you don't like the people you're working with, uh, go find other people. Bribe them, do whatever you need to do. Uh, it, the first few times you take a pulmonary vessel um, thoracoscopically, uh, you probably need beta blockers to keep your uh, from stroking out because it's quite nerve wracking. Um, and then do an anatomic resection. Don't take shortcuts. Um, and first, do no harm. I tell people, it, there, it's never a comp, if you could start a procedure thoracoscopically, you learn something, the team learns something every time. It's never a complication to convert to open because you can't proceed. And be safe and, and take the time. And so you remember I showed you this? Um, well, here's a kid who came to me to my chest wall defect clinic to see if I could do anything. And he had um, 
he had a CPAM when he was young. And again, you know, he, he had a standard thoracotomy, but he's got significant morbidity from that. So this is not something that we don't see anymore. It is still quite common, and, it, and the results of our thoracotomy are quite great. Um, but if you use these approaches, so this is, this is um, Teresa, and Teresa was, um, I was invited to Madrid in 2004, and we did the first thoracoscopic lobectomy. Um, and the mother, Isabella, every year on the anniversary of the date of that surgery sends me a picture of uh, Teresa and thanks me again for doing this procedure thoracoscopically. And you can see she's turned into a beautiful young woman. And so there truly is the benefit to doing this to our p patients. And I think as pediatric surgeons, you know, it's incumbent on us to do that. So as uh, Victor Hugo once said, an invasion of armies could be resisted, but not an idea whose time has come. And I certainly think we're there. Um, so, you know, in Colorado, people who, a lot of people put their head in the snow for a long time and, and didn't pay attention, but I don't think that's the right thing to do. And if you look around, it's actually quite amazing and quite beautiful what you can see and do with thoracoscopy. Um, and uh, the only thing better is probably a two-foot powder day um, in Colorado. And uh, again, we have a meeting. Um, Stanford is a co-sponsor this year, and I'm, I'm really excited to have all the faculty come. Um, I think it's going to be a great year, but if any of you are interested, we'd love to have you. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention, and uh, thank you again. It's a great honor to be here.